So we left off last week with Joseph experiencing a meteoric rise from being a slave to being essentially the prime minister of Egypt. And this is all because Joseph is able to successfully interpret Pharaoh's troubling dreams, which indicate that Egypt and the wider world are going to experience seven years of bumper crops and then seven years of terrible famine. And Joseph has good ideas for how to address this famine, so Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of everything so that Egypt can be adequately prepared. And Joseph takes one-fifth of all the grain produced during all the years of plenty, and uh, this ensures that there's grain once the famine gets underway. So we pick up two years into the famine, and things are going really well for Joseph. His plan has worked to perfection, and people are coming from far and wide to Egypt to purchase grain. Now, back in Canaan, the famine is hitting Joseph's family hard. And Joseph's brothers had, so you remember, had sold him into slavery many years earlier at this point. And none of them expect that uh, Joseph is alive and well and head of the Egyptian government. So seeing the food situation, uh, Joseph's father, Jacob, has heard there's all this grain in Egypt. So he sends 10 of his sons down with money to buy food for their people. His youngest son, Benjamin, he keeps at home. And Benjamin is Joseph's only full brother, and he's Jacob's favorite son since Joseph is now gone. So all the brothers except Benjamin head down to Egypt to buy food. Now they arrive there, and they go before Joseph and bow down and ask for food. But the brothers don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph very much recognizes them. And he decides to treat them at first as strangers. And he speaks harshly to them and accuses them of being spies in order to fully interrogate them about their family. So the brothers insist they're not spies and they tell Joseph about their father and their brothers and the other family. And upon hearing this, uh, Joseph decides to orchestrate a test for his brothers. He lets them purchase grain, but he requires that they leave a brother with him, Simeon. And he demands that they bring Benjamin to Egypt so that Joseph can therefore have proof to see whether they've spoken the truth about this family that they say they have. So the brothers are distraught at this turn of events, but they agree because food is desperately needed for their family back in Canaan. And as the brothers are figuring out what to do, Joseph overhears them telling each other that they must be facing uh, this misfortune as a penalty for what they'd done to Joseph so many years prior. So Joseph had been speaking uh, Egyptian to his brothers through a translator. So um, the brothers didn't hide their conversation from Joseph because they didn't realize that he could speak Hebrew or whatever Canaanite language uh, they spoke at this time. So the brothers head home and tell their father what's happened. And at first, Jacob is adamant that they not take his favorite son, Benjamin, away from him. But eventually, the family needs more food, and they don't want to forever abandon Simeon in an Egyptian prison. And the older brothers swear to their father that they will protect Benjamin. And Jacob reluctantly agrees to let them return to Egypt so that their family won't starve to death. So the brothers return to Egypt and are immediately brought to Joseph's house. And after some dinner and conversation with Joseph, all the brothers are released to go home with food. And the text tells us that a few times during these conversations, Joseph is so overwhelmed with feeling that he has to excuse himself to cry and then return to continue the conversation with his brothers. So the brothers start journeying back to Canaan, but unbeknownst to them, Joseph has played a trick on them. He's planted a silver cup in Benjamin's bag, and once the brothers are headed home, he sends men after them to accuse the brothers of stealing his silver cup. And the brothers insist on their innocence, but when they're, search, when they're searched, a cup is found in Benjamin's bag. So this is uh, terrible news, and the rest of Joseph's brothers rush back to the city and plead for Benjamin to be released. And Judah, whose idea it was to sell Joseph into slavery in the first place, gives a heartfelt appeal saying to imprison Judah instead of Benjamin. And upon hearing Judah's plea, Joseph is so overcome with emotion that he orders all the Egyptians out of the room, which would have included his interpreter. And then Joseph speaks in his own native language and reveals himself to his brothers. And at first the brothers are shocked and dismayed, but after further assurances, they and Joseph embrace. 
And Joseph tells them how he sees the will of God in what's happened since his brothers had sold him into slavery. By selling him into slavery, God had worked through Joseph to preserve life. And Joseph insists his brothers gather up their families and come live in Egypt in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh is so pleased with Joseph's work that he happily agrees to have all of Joseph's family come to the kingdom. And if this were a fairy tale, this is basically the point where we would say they all lived happily ever after. And essentially, happily ever after is what the people get for a number of generations. So I'm going to get into what some of the aspects of this story mean for us, but I do want to touch on how these events connect with like the larger biblical narrative. So one of the questions I had as a kid watching uh, the Ten Commandments yearly on ABC was, uh, why were the Israelites in Egypt when they are from Israel? And uh, the answer to that question is the Joseph story explains why all the Hebrew people went from Canaan to Egypt. It's, it's because of Joseph. They all came to follow Joseph. And uh, after a few generations in Egypt, the pharaohs will, for will forget all the good service that uh, was rendered by Joseph. And uh, the Israelites will then be enslaved, which sets up the events for Exodus and all the things with Moses. Now, another thing worth noting about Joseph's actions during the famine is that uh, they result in pretty much all the Egyptians being enslaved to Pharaoh. People run out of money after a few years of famine, so Joseph then accepts livestock, land, and eventually people selling themselves into slavery to pay for food, resulting in most Egyptians being slaves to Pharaoh then. And many interpreters think the enslavement of the Israelites may have been some balancing of the scales for what had been done to the Egyptians at Joseph's hand generations earlier. Now, the text never explicitly says that, but I think this inversion of who is enslaved speaks to how the hurts and grievances inflicted on a people have a way of uh, sticking around and causing harm far into the future. For a, a milder example of this, uh, this sort of intergenerational grievance it makes me think about a, a neighbor my grandma had when she was a snowbird in Charleston, South Carolina. This neighbor would call the cops on my grandma for having an unregistered vehicle because her car was registered in that Yankee state of Connecticut. So some people are still fighting the Civil War, and generational scars and trauma and prejudice are hard things to let go of. So let's look at what goes on between Joseph and his brothers. What does all of this mean? Why does Joseph do this whole elaborate trick? So what's going on is it seems Joseph was unsure whether he wanted to reconcile with his brothers if they were still the same men who would sell their brother into slavery. So he orchestrates these tests to see if his brothers had learned to love each other. If his brothers were still the same jealous people who sold him into slavery, they would have been happy to abandon their brother Benjamin in order to get rid of their father's new favorite son. But when faced with abandoning their brother Benjamin, Joseph's brothers stick by Benjamin instead. And Judah has a redemption moment of sorts and offers to trade himself for Benjamin, which is a big moment of character development for him as he was the mastermind behind selling Joseph into slavery. Judah's standing up for Benjamin shows that Joseph's brothers have grown. And it's after that that Joseph decides to reconcile with his family. Now, one of the things I appreciate about this series of interactions between Joseph and his brothers is that it's an example of forgiveness and reconciliation where people who have committed the offense actually have repented and changed their ways. Now, one of the most problematic ways the church has preached forgiveness is that abused people need to forgive and welcome back their abusers, and often the abuser is not held to account to change their behavior. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's a leader in the Confessing Church in Germany that led resistance against the Nazis, he famously termed this sort of preaching in the church as cheap grace. He writes, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, 
grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Now, I'm not suggesting we all go around basing our forgiveness of one another through uh, complicated schemes of like feigned cup theft, but I think it's worth noting that Joseph is not interested in cheap grace for his brothers. His brothers prove that they've changed their ways before he decides to reconcile with them. And in looking at this, I think it's worth seeing forgiveness and reconciliation as two separate but related things. On the most basic level, forgiveness in the Bible is about foregoing revenge and breaking cycles of violence and retribution. If anyone's ever going to fairly balance the scales of justice, it's the Lord. So we shouldn't take matters into our own hands by seeking vengeance. And some of Jesus' teachings would indicate going further than that in terms of what's required of us for forgiveness, but that is a forgiveness sermon for a different day. So in the lesson for today, we see Joseph forgive his brothers first by refraining from taking revenge on them. Joseph was in charge of everything. He could have easily imprisoned all of them or had them executed, but he doesn't do that. And we see Joseph reconcile after his brothers have proved repentance. And I find this like kind of a helpful way to think about um, forgiveness and reconciliation in our own relationships, because a Forgiveness without reconciliation is possible. You can forgive someone, but then not resume the relationship with them. And I think sometimes that's the most holy outcome for a number of relationships in life. And also, it's worth noting in this case with Joseph and his brothers, forgiveness and reconciliation take time. Joseph has been in Egypt around two decades at this point, and sometimes You need a lot of time to heal divides and mend hurts. Now, as Christians, we're called to love one another as God has loved us. And in Christ, we're shown that God's love involves being willing to die to save others, to die even for the people who would put you on the cross. The command that we love one another as Christ loved us is probably the hardest thing we're commanded to do. But we don't do this alone. God is at work in the world, in us, and in ways we can't see, working to preserve life and share love. And even when we fall short, God's work and will continues. Our loving actions in the world with God's help make a difference, and we're called to not repay evil for evil, but to overcome evil with good. In the Joseph story, we see an annoying teenager who's sold into slavery by his own brothers, then rise to being in charge of a kingdom, and then save those very same brothers and countless others. Joseph isn't perfect, and neither are any of us. But the good news is that it's precisely through imperfect people that God works to preserve life and overcome evil with good. Amen.